Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Terrariums are a low maintenance way to grow plants indoors. Today we're going to see how to build one. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot, I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Nancy Morrow. Ms. Nancy is our terrarium expert, and Mr. D is here today. Howdy. How y'all doing? Good. Good. All right, Ms. Nancy, it's good to have you. I'm really glad to be here, Chris. All right, let's start with this. All righty. What are terrariums? Terrariums are glass containers okay. that are enclosed uh, with a glass top, because you want to be able to get your light in from the top and the side. Sometimes people will put you know, a solid top here, and then their plants grow weird. Okay, <laughs> grow weird. Grow okay. weird, yeah, because they're <laughs> they're growing towards the sun. The sun. <laughs> and another thing, this is really my big pet peeve in life, okay. is that people put uh, succulents in a terrarium, and you know, succulents are are desert desert plants sure. or low moisture plants, right. and that's that's a plant in a glass bowl. It's not okay. a terrarium. I got you. So <laughs> we got that out of the way. All right. So what's so special about terrariums anyway? Well, um, they really changed botany and agriculture in our, in our, in our world. People don't realize it, but um, before uh, they figured out how to do this, um, when you would try to get something like from the Asia to Europe, you know, sugar cane or you know, whatever it mm -hmm. is you're trying to grow, tea, you know, okay. tea plants, you couldn't get them there because it was a two or three month journey. Yeah. You're on this ship, nobody's taking care of right, it, it right. gets dried out, blah, blah, blah. When they figured out how to do this, it was like this whole new world because it's a mini greenhouse. And if you build it right and seal the top, it's going to stay moist until you unpack it. Okay. So let's build one. All, All righty. Let's see how you do this. Okay. okay. Well, uh, a, a big part of what I've seen about people who build terrariums and then fail is they don't do it exactly right. And okay. if you do it exactly right with the right ingredients at the beginning, then you just sail on. Okay. Otherwise, you're in big trouble. Wow. So yeah. first you want to start with um, some kind of uh, gravel or rock bottom. And uh, it's kind of, a, you know, your choice depends on your container and, you know, it's a design thing. Okay. But what's important about this is you make a layer down here that um, any extra water will drain down here and be held so that you don't get soggy up here. That you want to be moist but not soggy. Okay. So then you uh, use a horticultural charcoal, uh -huh. which is basically, you know, in a water filter. You have mm -hmm. activated carbon, same thing. So um, you can get this pretty much anywhere that, you know, sells gardening supplies. And you just kind of mix it in down here. Okay. And, and they, it keeps it sweet. So then, and this is the biggest, biggest thing that people don't do right. This is called um, sphagnum moss. Yeah, it's pretty dry. Yeah, it's very dry. I, <laughs> want it, I want you to be able to see the right. difference in it, okay? So you put it in here, it's like a sponge. And it holds the water. It also has kind of some um, antibacterial products to it properties to it so that it, again, it helps keep it clean and stable. Okay. So you want to get it totally soaking, soaking wet, and then you make a little layer and put it on top of your, your gravel. And you want to cover the whole thing because it holds moisture and it stops your soil from falling down here. Okay, I got you. So um, the last thing is the soil, and I, I make a special soil mix. Um, two important things about it is that um, you don't want it to be, um, you know, a lot of soil mixes have a lot of food in it. Okay. You don't want a lot of food in it. it it'll, you limit your resources in a terrarium. It's kind of like bonsai. You, so they, they don't grow out of control. Okay, and, right. You know, it's just too much for it. Okay. And, so no uh, extra fertilizers and things like that in the, right. in the soil. I got you. Uh, okay. And you, you, um, you want it to be real wet. See how wet this is? Yeah, it's wet. In comparison to that which yeah, is what it looks good. like when you mix it. Right. Usually you just kind of ponder your container, 
kind of look at your plants and you kind of plan in your mind how it's going to come out before you start planting. So you have to have the design up here. It helps. It helps. <laughs> it really right. helps. So um, usually, you know, I start with something that'll be a good anchor and be really pretty. It's pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So I want to put it kind of close to the edge so you can see it. And I want to anchor it a little bit because I sure don't want it rolling around later, macking my glass. And then um, you always want to have contours. You don't want it just to be flat. Okay. Nothing, in, nothing in nature is flat. So mm -hmm. your eye is pleased by contours. So we mounded it up? Yeah. So um, the first plant I'm going to put in is, is what they call a, a running plant, kind of okay. like a strawberry, how they send out little shoots. And it's not, it's not exactly a vine, but kind of like a vine. And um, it's inclining that way. Okay. That's how it's growing. So um, I want it to come up this hill, so I'm going to put it down here and let it come up and kind of crawl over this. Okay. And I, I soaked it in water first just to make sure it, it was good, good, and, good and wet before it went in. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm, I'm going to place it here. And then instead of trying to dig a hole and stick it in, I'm filling in around it. And what kind of plant was it? Um, you know, I, it's some kind of pilea. Several mm, of these okay. plants are pileas. You want to really be sure to firm the plants in. And not just cram it in, right? You don't want to cram mm. it in, but you don't want to leave any air pockets either. Okay. You want to make sure it's firmly placed. So I brought uh, a couple <laughs> of little figurines here. Um, right. Got our little face dirty. Um, and you always kind of want to think about proportion. I, I brought this bicycle to kind of show you about proportion. Um, you want everything to be in proportion. You, like this is a grown fairy, okay. <laughs> and this is a baby fairy. All right. You know, so that works. But if you tried to put a little bicycle with it, it's mm. a cool bicycle, but it doesn't fit with any of okay. these. So that would really bother your head. Okay. So I kind of thought maybe she would be up here. And again, you really have to place things so they don't fall over on you later. And then I wanted something tall behind her. Because ultimately, as this grows in, she's going to be a little hidden. OK. Because fairies hide. Fairies you know, hide. they get up in the wood. They do. So this is a, it's a pilea. They call it an aluminum plant. Mm. And um, it's something I, I keep and grow from cuttings. OK. So you can see the, um, see the roots That's in there. Good system. Yeah. And see all these roots here. He really likes to grow and sprawl. Okay. And this will grow as tall as this container. Okay. And then it'll fall over and it just, it's pretty aggressive. Okay. I'll have to ultimately trim it back a good bit. All oh, right, do a little pruning, huh? Do what? Pruning. Pruning, pruning yes. Yeah. So with this plant, I'm going to try and uh, bring, bring these stems down and cover them too. That's why I showed you the, uh, the roots on it earlier. Mm -hmm. Kind of like with a tomato plant, you know how you plant as much of the stem as possible because right, then right. it'll root. That's what this guy will do. When you first plant them, plants get shocked by being moved. Sure. You know, they're not built to travel. So, um, you know, the first week or two, they don't look like much. They're just like, oh, I'm not sure. But then they get to know each other, you know, <laughs> they make a little microcosm there. They realize they've got to deal with it. Yeah, they're, they're, I'm here, I'm staying. So... Um, it's coming together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to look at it right here. Mm -hmm. So I thought I would put um, some moss here. Okay. Just to kind of hold her space and uh, uh, make a little carpet there. And so I, again, it's a mini greenhouse. Okay. You know, it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, this is a moss you could get from around here. Okay. This came from Southeast Shelby County, the Southeast Collierville area. Southeast Shelby County, all right. And then I ordered it actually from around the country because different mosses come from different places. Yes. So, and when, when I buy this moss, it doesn't look like this. 
And again, because you know, it gets shocked. So again, you really want to firm it down. You don't want it having any air up under it. And your moss doesn't have roots, mm -hmm. which is a, a fabulous thing. Um, this is a primula. It's a um, primrose. Mm -hmm. It's a um, tropical that? primrose. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of tricky to get plants out. This is a, a brittle plant. If you're not careful, these leaves will break on you. I like this plant because it blooms in a low light condition. But I have to be sure to put it in something tall enough that when the bloom stalk comes up, it has room to, to come up. Oh, okay, I got you. And it's just a pretty little plant. Nice little rosette. Let's turn it around this way. Because when you have a circle like this, you really want it to have interest from all sides. Sure. And um, speaking of interest from all sides, um, you need to put your terrarium where it gets good light. Mm -hmm. You don't want it in direct sunlight because it'll get too hot. A lot of times I, I, I'll put mine in a, a table that's kind of below the window. So like if it's an east or south window, only that much of it is in the window. Okay. And then the light kind of drops down on it. Gotcha. Like filtered. Because <laughs> these all grow in the jungle and filtered sure. light. Um, Good information. I'm glad you mentioned yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, people want to put them in bookshelves. Don't do that. Unless you put a uh, plant light in there. Mm. You know, you can get a little plant strip light sure. and put it in there, but you can't just put it over there and say, oh, well, there's a window three feet away. That's not going to cut it. So um, this is a uh, petrified wood. Mm. And mm -hmm. uh, again, everywhere I go, what you Pick something up what, right. what's Pick over that. there? <laughs> so. Um, Kind of put it at a an angle so you have a little you know up okay. mm -hmm. to your design. Um, so this is interesting. I told you this was a pilea. Okay. This is also a pilea. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's cute, huh? It is. So this um, this grows kind of in a mat, and it'll just. Okay. So I thought it'd be pretty to put it back here and then kind of let it kind of grow out around this. I think I'll put it here. What's kind of cool about putting it here is that um, it'll start creeping up the glass. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, then it, you know, get the roots, and it's you know it's kind of cool. But this will be pretty aggressive once it once it starts growing. It'll end it'll up being something. You, yeah, right. you'll have to trim back. And it's always better to. Um, Keep it trimmed back, then to let it get out of control, and then try and take it back. Mm. That's true of about anything. Yeah, I'm about yeah. to say, I was just thinking <laughs> that. Yeah. Anything in your garden, for sure. Mm -hmm. Of course, it'd be real hard to get lopping shears. Get lopping shears <laughs> yeah. <in> yeah. <coughs> yeah. I don't think that'll work down here. Or chainsaw. Yeah. It's filling up. Yeah, mm -hmm. and again, you know, you really have to not fill it. You know, there's a temptation to want to. I have a lot of plants in there. Yeah, and yeah. have it look like the final product, but um, you have to have room to grow. So um, this is sphagnum moss. This is live moss. That's this live. Okay. Right. And um, I get this for some people down by Chattanooga, big bags of it. It's a pretty aggressive grower too. But it's you're hard great. to resist. You've seen all your life like that, and mm -hmm. then to see it so mm -hmm. beautiful like this. Like that. See, now I'm thinking, do I really want to put anything else in, or do I want to maybe let it grow oh. and move around? So um, I brought various kinds of little doodads that are uh, um, the finishing touch. Right. So I, I was going to show you kind of basically how I do it. And again, it's not going to how it's going to look when it's done. Sure, done. sure. But um, so this is a, a mix of um, uh, kind of aquarium gravel and then these beautiful stones. These are all nice. kinds of uh, semi-precious stones that have been tumbled. Nice color. And, uh, you know, I learned in nature, nothing is homogenous. 
you know. That's if, true. If you were to just put one color there, it would look so man-made. It's not funny. And you, you do better to mix it first and then put it down. You think, oh, well, I put a little of this and a little of that. Well, nature's random. Mm -hmm. So when you make a design, you want to have as much random to it as you can. And I always like to say that this is kind of like framing a picture. Okay. You know? I can see that. So like I said, I just kind of want to give you the idea of how it looks because um, all of this is going to kind of settle around and uh, you know, I'm not really sure ultimately how I want it to look. But um, so we have these two little girls here, another little fairy. Mm -hmm. But see, she's a little girl. Mm -hmm. So I thought what would be <laughs> funny would be to put her over here where she doesn't even know there's fairies behind her. Okay. You know? And then this little one looks like it's kind of thinking. So I thought I'd kind of sit it up here where it's kind of. No. Yeah, all right. You know, not everybody likes fairies and things like that, it's but right. uh, you know, they're a little sweet thing. Mm -hmm. I guess what else I would say is that um, over here, you know, we have this space right here and uh, I might go ahead and put this here. It's similar to the one on the other side, but not the same. Yes, mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of a balance. So let me wipe it down a little bit okay. and uh, I'll take a look at it. It's a good idea to keep washing the glass as you go because the more you put into it, the harder it's going to be to get to your glass. Mm -hmm. So if you see that you've made a mess, go ahead and get it before you go on. All right, Ms. Nasty, so it looks good, okay? Well, thank but, you. But how do we seal it? Well, um, when you first finish it, I recommend sealing it with this uh, plastic wrap, mm -hmm. which never wants to cooperate. <laughs> but uh, it makes a really, really good seal, and you can close it and open it over the next month mm -hmm. without having to worry about breaking your glass top. Okay because glass tops are hard to come by, you don't want to break them. Okay. But I do have a glass top that I thought I would show you what that looks like. There you go. Um, I had this cut. Um, a lot of times I just use a, a glass, clear glass plate, but this looks a lot more elegant. Mm -hmm. And um, what's um, tricky about this is that um, glass is not necessarily uniform. Okay. So you see how this is? Tilting yeah, like that. Right. This isn't a perfect seal. Okay. So once or twice a year, you might have to add water. Okay. Once or twice a year. Once or twice a year. Yeah, okay. yeah. And uh, if you have one that's a, a true seal, where it fits tight, like a mason jar or something, you never have to water it. You hear that? <laughs> never have to water it. Own little water cycle. Yeah. That's it. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So thank you again, Miss Nancy. We appreciate thank that. Thank you, Chris. All right. I had a good corn crop this year. This is the first time that I've grown corn this thick, but this was actually a University of Tennessee recommendation for a small garden, and it really turned out well. We had very few problems. I think the only insect problem that I've been able to spot is uh, maybe some borer damage, probably the European corn borer right there clearly bored into the stalk of the plant and it fell over, but it was probably after the corn was ready. We had a few problems with uh, poor pollination. When you see a kernel missing, like we have right here, then that means that for some reason that kernel didn't get pollinated. And to understand how that happens, to understand the corn plant, this, this, the tassel is the male structure of the plant and it produces pollen. And each one of these silks travels to a kernel and forms a kernel. And a, one piece of pollen has to get into this silk. And anything that disrupts that can result in poor pollination. And we had some really high temperatures a few weeks ago. And when the temperatures are up approaching 100, you know, upper 90s and things like that, that sometimes interferes a little bit with pollination. And that's probably what happened here. Now, we're pretty much through with this corn crop. 
Uh, you can compost the corn stalks if you like. You have goats or cows, they love them. You can feed them to goats or cattle. Prepare the soil. You can plant peas, butter beans, or just kind of hold off and get it ready for some of your fall vegetables if you like. All right, so here's our Q&A segment. Ms. Nancy, you have something to say, you jump in there with us, all right? Okay. That's right. We all need right. all the help we can get. <laughs> so here's our first viewer email. Something's eating my basil and leaving black poop. <laughs> what is it? This is from Miss Linda. Eating a basil, black poop. I mean, it has to be some type of caterpillar, right? That's what I'd say. Yeah. You know, that's the only thing I can think of. And I know else? there's several caterpillars that will feed on basil. Okay. There, there are several. I think uh, uh, I found a, uh, a little info. Let's see what kind of caterpillar types. Cabbage looper. Oh, wow. And the beet army worm. Okay. So army worms so army will feed worm. on there. Right. Okay. So and, and sometimes they're kind of hard to see. Cut worms will also cut them off close okay. to the ground. It's easy to, you know, it's not feeding on the leaves. Right. It's just cutting them down. Just cut them off. Right. But uh, pretty much all of these, uh, uh, you can take care of with BT. Yeah. You know, Bacillus thuringiensis. Something that's safe. On the, on the beet army worm and and the, uh, the cabbage looper, I think will. Uh, take BT will take care of it, or some of the other harder insecticides if you, okay. if you feel so inclined. Yeah, they used the BTs though, they're a lot safer and they work. Yeah, yeah. They work so I'd good. definitely start with that. Yeah, I would start with the BTs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, obviously, yeah, it's a caterpillar. Yeah, anything that's eaten. Yeah, you gotta be a Your caterpillar. Your leaves, and leaving black poop. Yeah. It's the caterpillar. You gotta be a caterpillar. All right, so there you have it, Miss Linda. All right, here's our next viewer email. I have what looks like phenoxy herbicide damage happening again and again on my tomatoes. They're in a raised bed made of horse manure and other soil mixes. Are there herbicides in the soil and will it ever be any good? Thanks, and this is from Angela. All right, Mr. Dave, Phenoxy herbicide. <laughs> I know what you're gonna say. All right, raised bed, horse manure, soil mixes. All right, is it in the soil? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> okay. so. You know, phenoxy herbicides do have some pre-emergent activity, but they're they primarily post-emergent uh -huh. herbicides. Uh, I guess my first question would be... Yeah, I got a couple. My first question would be, Angela, do you happen to spray your lawn I, with Trimec? Yeah. You know, if you, if you are, or some product that contains 2,4-D dicamba mm -hmm. and, you know, or, if, or does your neighbor, mm -hmm. uh, if you or your neighbor uh, especially during hot weather yes you know especially yes. if they routinely go out there and spray their lawn with one of these uh, broadleaf herbicides that are labeled for use in home lawns uh, then that's where your problem's coming from uh, it could be uh, you know especially if they're downwind upwind from you mm -hmm. and the wind blows it on there but it, if they do it late in the afternoon or in the, you know uh, there's inversions can take place and these things volatize and yes. and uh, and uh, you know the ones especially the 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 products that are in these home uh, uh, remedies that are out there and uh, I think the label probably tells you not to do it if the temperature is above a certain. It does above 85 you know, degrees. Yeah, if the temperature right. is above 85. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure you're supposed to use these. Either, so uh, you need to make sure you read the label. But that's the first thing I would think of. Uh, I just don't think that uh, you know. I mean, sure, the horses could have been eaten in a pasture that was treated with a mm -hmm. with a uh, phenoxy herbicide. But I just don't think it's going to go through and because the phenoxy herbicides are auxins mm -hmm. that are naturally occurring right. you know any anyway in right. in uh, the plant and they the phenoxy herbicides actually they don't kill the plant they cause the plant to yeah, grow, grow so like fast crazy. it grows itself right. to death it just, right, it grows and that's why the tomatoes are probably going like you know, twisting and, and curling yeah, yeah, yeah. and the leaves are stretching out mm -hmm. there if that's and that's what phenoxy herbicide does. looks right. like on, on tomatoes but uh, I just don't think it's in the soil. I would look around. Uh, I would make sure that I'm not spraying those tomatoes uh, with fungicide with a spray tank that I also use mm. to control weeds mm -hmm. in my lawn because, you know, it's very easy to get tank contamination, mm -hmm. you know, like that. If you're, so, so you, if you're spraying fungicides on tomatoes, make sure you have a dedicated sprayer I mean, you can wash the spray tank out, but don't do it. You know, get you a dedicated sprayer that you use to spray fungicides and insecticides. Mm -hmm. You can spray both of those 
in, in that tank. But anything you use to kill <laughs> weeds, <No. laughs> don't don't put a fungicide and insecticide in that and, and expect, expect not to have some damage. I would agree. I yeah. yeah, there you have it, Miss Angela. We appreciate that question. All right, so Miss Nancy, Mr. D, we're out of time. It's been fun. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. If you want more information about terrariums or want to watch the segment again while you build one, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. While you're there, you can ask us your gardening question. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.